Mary Marie Hammonds, missing from South Shore, Kentucky, since October 11th, 1949. She was 16 at the time that she disappeared. She was a white female with strawberry blonde hair that was shoulder length, blue eyes, five foot one, and around 140 pounds. Um, she had left home when she was 16, but she was staying in the area. A family friend said they saw her running from one house to another near a railroad track in Greenup County in 1980. This is dated 2013. This is from the Daily Independent. Hoping she's still alive. Clyde Hammonds of Ashland does not know what became of his sister, Mary Marie, or if she is even still alive, but he holds out hope that one day they will find each other. He said his sister left home when she was 16 and just seemed to vanish. I never seen or heard from her after that. She always told Mom she was leaving home when she turned 16, and she did. She left and went to Pickett Branch, and a man picked her up, and we never saw her again. He said he, he decided to actively try to find her again after hearing about a woman's body being recovered in a well in Ohio. She might have passed away by now, but I thought I'm still living, so I might as well look for her. Hammonds has talked to people at the area of funeral homes and nursing homes in hopes of finding a clue about his sister's whereabouts. But so far, the closest he has come is an eyewitness report from a railroad worker who says he saw someone who looked like her and he believed to be her in South Shore during the 1980s. He has no photos of his sister. He has no photos of his sister past the second grade, but he carries a photo of their mother and another sister who had a very strong resemblance. Their parents were Smith and Ethel Yates Hammonds. Her name was Mary Marie Hammonds, and she may go by Marie, um, the, last, the long lost sister was born October 11th, 1933. She had blue eyes and strawberry blonde hair. She had a very good sense of humor. Um, she was just a little bit off. Anything was funny to her, he said, apologizing for the lack of details, as he was very young when he last saw her. It's hard to recall a lot about her, he said. Um, Hammonds retired as a supervisor of grounds and transportation from the Ashland school system and said his sister has always been on his mind. When she first left, it bothered me for a long time, and I almost got over it when they found out about the woman in the well. I always prayed she would be found and we would have a happy reunion, he says. Um, this was, like I said, this was 10 years ago. This story was printed in the independent, Daily Independent. So he was 80 at the time. So he would be 90 now. I don't know if he's still living or not. Um, there's not a whole lot else about her. When a case is that old and a cold case has been that long it's really hard to uh, find a whole lot of information most of the people who were around back then have now passed away and don't know what the circumstances might have been about her Let's see if i can find anything on this woman the disappearance of tonetta carlisle this is from stories of the unsolved Tonetta Yvette Carlisle was born August 28, 1973, and lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, with her mother and brother. 
Those who knew her remember her being a big fan of fast food and pizza, and that she would often go spend her time listening to rap music. Her favorite artist was Bobby Brown. At the time of her disappearance, her family was living in the 600 block of Hamilton Avenue. Her residence was a 20-minute walk from the city high school where she was a freshman. Tonetta was last seen leaving City High School at around 2.55 p.m. March 16, 1989. Five minutes later, she was abducted, a kidnapping that was observed by a witness. According to the witness, she had been on Ruth Street when she heard a commotion on the street, down the street near 615 Hamilton Avenue. Looking down the hill, she saw several unidentified persons jumping out of a tan and yellow van, surrounding Tonetta and forced her into the van before pulling away. The witness and her husband jumped in their car and chased after the van. While they were unable to keep up, they did manage to get a license plate number, Tennessee LKH920, and they relayed this information on to the authorities. Eight, hour la eight hours later, Tonetta's mother, Nani, called 911 to report that her daughter had not returned home from school. A missing child report was filed. Unfortunately, the report and the call about the abduction were not connected for at least two days. When the authorities realized that Tonetta had lived just a short distance from where the abduction happened. The license plate of the vehicle involved in the abduction was eventually connected to a man by the name of Jeffrey Jones. He was a convicted rapist who had served eight years in prison on charges of rape and aggravated sexual assault. He was released a year before Tonetta was kidnapped and it was later determined he had raped a woman in his apartment complex just two months before the teenager was last seen. The day investigators went to speak with him, March 18, 1989, they found him deceased in the van, with the cause of death being suicide by result of carbon monoxide poisoning. He left behind no note. After locating the van, police officers, bloodhounds, and deputies come the area searching for any information related to the case. There have been various rumors and information received around the theory that Tonetta was forced into prostitution and taken to California, becoming a victim, victim of trafficking. The Chattanooga Police Department reached out to the Sheriff's Office but were unable to find any evidence of her having been transported out of Tennessee. In August of 2019, the Chattanooga District Attorney announced the police department's cold case unit would be reopening the case. He shared that investigators had eliminated some of the theories brought forward in the initial investigation and that the focus had been moved toward Jeffrey Jones. New DNA samples have been taken from her mother and brother. Her mother has criticized the police investigation, saying investigators should have started looking as soon as they received the 911 call rather than waiting until the missing child report and the abduction were connected. She believes her daughter was killed by Jones and buried in an undisclosed location. Tonetta's case has been featured on America's Most Wanted. In August of 2019, to celebrate what would have been her 46th birthday, her family and friends gathered in Chattanooga's Coolidge Park to release balloons. Um, I would have searched that van, even though back at that time DNA was not a, you know, on the radar, but I would have searched that van and see if there were traces of blood or anything. Maybe they did. Maybe they kept 
whatever information or, or evidence they may have found. I'm sure that the police processed that van uh, looking for blood, looking for any kind of evidence that uh, Tonetta had been in the van. But keep in mind also this was a time before DNA and I don't know what may have been kept, what items they may have found in the van and kept, and even if it was the same van, you know. Um, the coincidence that this man committed suicide, or at least that's what the police have said, that when they went there to talk to him about the disappearance of this young girl, they found him um, in the van he had committed suicide. Now, that's, I have no <laughs> more information on that, but the people having come forward over the years saying that they saw someone who they believed to be her in supermarkets, different supermarkets, um, all across the United States, different parts of the western part of the United States. There's a movie, I cannot think of the name of it right now, it's American Honey, maybe, I might be wrong about that, it's something Honey, and Shia, it stars Shia LaBeouf, and it's about this, this, these people that were considered, I guess you could call them grifters, but what they do basically is they go around and they pick up young, vulnerable teenagers, mostly runaways, which Tonetta was not a runaway. She was walking home from school. And this is probably unrelated to do with her whatsoever, but um, they will send these young kids out. They get them kind of, they kind of, I guess you would call, they become indentured to these people. They offer them food, they offer them clothing, they offer them a place to stay, drugs, whatever they might want. They let them live the free, happy lifestyle of the um, runaway, you know. Um, but what they do is they will make them go out and sell stuff. Sometimes it's their own self that they are forced to sell. Other times it is um, these these people that come around. We all hear about this, and everybody gets these warnings about these people that come around to your home trying to sell um, vacuum cleaners. They'll come to the door. They'll have like a, a bottle of uh, laundry detergent or something, a carton of pop. <laughs> whatever it might be, and they'll come to your door and they'll say, could we demonstrate this for you? There's no obligation to buy, but if you allow us to come in and demonstrate this vacuum cleaner, we will give you this free item. And some people say, yeah, sure, come on in, you know, because <laughs> there's usually two or three of them. And the best thing to do is just to kindly say, no, thank you. <laughs> or not even open the door to begin with. Each one of these kids goes out and, and they go into supermarkets because they people in the supermarket shopping believe that these people work there. They come up to them and they say, today we're giving away this great whatever, you know, and all you have to do is fill this out. Well, the person in the supermarket thinks, this kid works here, I mean, I don't know if this is as, if these people do this as much today as they probably did in the 80s and 90s, before everybody was carrying a cell phone, you know, to look them up to see if this was legit or whatever, but the thing is, is they, they don't really enslave these people. It's not like that they are not free to leave, and um, I just don't think that this girl 
fits that category. Now, it's a dangerous thing that um, in that movie, one of the girls ends up getting into a lot of other trouble. I'll just leave that there in case you haven't watched it. But I don't think that this is what happened to this girl. I don't think she ended up with a group of people who, some people say that she was um, forced into prostitution and that type of thing. More than likely, it was this man. But I just watched a documentary on one of the true crime shows the other day about a girl who had gone to Myrtle Beach and had gone missing during her, her trip to Myrtle Beach. And she was, uh, another young woman also went missing around that same time. And a witness saw her being forced into a van by two men. One was driving, the other one jumps out, grabs her. He's a very large guy. He took, you know, he just he was able to subdue her. So, was this Jeffrey Jones, if he was the guy, was he working alone? Or did he have help? The witnesses that she saw her being forced into this van by more than one person. So who was the other person? And was Jeffrey Jones really even involved in that? Or was he just the suspect because he was a known sex offender living in the area? I don't know. But as of today, her case is still unsolved. 